chapter 9. Uh, and so at this point, we pretty much covered the major conflict scenario. We've done uh, current representation conflicts in 1.7, and now we're doing 1.9 formal representation, but we're sort of uh, looking forward and backward at the same time. We'll see that uh, when we do the hypos uh, that we're going to work on today. But I just put some, some, some of the major terms up on the board that we have been looking at. And we have been looking at this uh, concept of formal representation. And so we're looking at successive conflicts that often called subsequent conflicts. We have a present client that we're representing currently, maybe a prospective client, and we're doing something currently that impacts something that we did in the past, that formal representation. And so when we evaluate that, we have to look at what we're doing now and what impact that might have on something in the past. Because even though that representation has ended, our former client expects that undivided loyalty that the attorney owes to the client. And so we started looking at rule uh, 1.9. And 1.9 tells us that we have this continuing duty to a formally represented client. So we formally represented this client in a matter we shall not thereafter represent another person in the same or substantially related matter. Which is really just a way of saying we don't want you to undo what you did in the past with this former client. So you prepare a will for an elderly man and set it up very nicely. He passes away and then the son says, okay, I want you to undo the codicil that he put in there. Uh, so that's clear conflict, of course, you couldn't do that uh, because you've been working on the same matter uh, to undo uh, that uh, will that you did before. You can't say that the uh, person passed away, therefore the representation is terminated. Uh, you still have that continued duty to the to estate and everyone else who relied upon that. So that would be the same matter. Substantially related is something that we have to really look at uh, and try to figure out. We have it uh, in the book. It's something that could be related uh, to what we are doing presently. So that may not be the exact same thing, but there is some type of overlap, some type of commonality that, that we're trying to identify. So we'll look at that. Uh, so one thing that I emphasize is, apart from uh, the continuing duties to a former client, this is a comment one, We also noted that there is a presumption in Rule 1.9a. So that presumption serves a purpose. We don't want the former client to have to reveal actual confidences. And we look at this conflict in 1.9a as confidential information that a lawyer normally would obtain in that type of representation. And so we're looking at that. And then is it materially adverse? We compare that with directly adverse, which is a lot broader, stricter. Materially adverse is something that goes to the disadvantage of the former client, undermines the former client's interest. So that's 1.9a. What type of information? In the representation. I'll put normally, normally obtained. So in this line of practice, you're saying uh, that this is the type of information that the lawyer would come across. So there's no movement there. We just have the, the scenario where a lawyer in a firm previously represented another client, and then we look at whether or not this current representation conflicts with the former representation. Materially adverse to the interest of the former client. And then uh, there's uh, always this notion of informed consent. So the former client can always give informed consent. That doesn't need to always happen, uh, but it can. So moving down to B, that is a different situation. Lawyer moves. Lawyers shall not only represent a person in the same or substantially related matter, same type of language in which a firm with which the lawyer formerly was associated, so I bond from his former firm to my new firm, and now I'm doing something currently that may impact the work that I did at that former firm. Now, look at the language comment. Right, we're talking about actual knowledge here. Actual knowledge. So a higher standard when a lawyer moves to another firm. Is there. And that's an important distinction That's an important distinction because we're trying to balance a number of things. And if you look at uh, comment four, even before that, it tells us what we're trying to do. We're trying to do three things. Really, we are trying to make sure that this client previously represented by the former firm is reasonably assured that the principle of undivided loyalty is recognized by the attorney. So don't be fooled by, oh, this person is no longer the attorney here. There is still this notion of undivided loyalty. So we want to preserve that first and foremost. Secondly, the rules should not be so broad that it precludes other persons from having a reasonable choice of legal counsel. So we don't want this to be so rigid that, oh, that's a former conflict. You can never represent this person. The client may want that type of uh, representation. So we want to preserve undivided loyalty while at the same time preserving the client's right to choose. And then finally, the rules should not unreasonably hamper our movement. We should be able to move to different firms and not be precluded from pursuing our livelihood simply because of something that we did in the past. So third, the rule should not unreasonably hamper lawyers from forming new associations and taking on new clients. So, <laughs> and so we're going to do some imputation here. And I sort of want to emphasize comment form in that regard as well, because it says this. If we apply this rule very rigidly, if the concept of imputation were applied with unqualified rigor, the result would be radical curtailment of the opportunity of lawyers to move from one practice setting to another, and of the opportunity of clients to change counsel. So we want to preserve undivided loyalty, we want to give client choice, we want to allow lawyers to be able to move from place to place. There's nothing wrong with that. And that's why we have a higher standard here, actual knowledge. So the question changes when a lawyer moves from one firm to another from what type of information would the lawyer normally obtain in the representation to actual knowledge. And you see that in comment five. So that's what we did. And then we got up to, we're going to do toxic waste on page 345. But the very first problem on page 343, we said uh, keeping in touch. 
And you know, like keeping in touch was just a little simple hypothetical to allow us uh, to work through the rule initially to see if something that we did in the past conflicts with something that we're doing currently. And you saw in that case, you know, work done five years ago, the work was discreet, took place only one day. Some continuing newsletters, that's in there to sort of lead you down the path of saying, oh, this is representation, but not really. Uh, the former uh, client, in quotation marks, always declines our offers to uh, work on different matters. So really, this former client on some level just gets uh, newsletters. Uh, and you see on page 343, your preliminary review suggests that the only problem relates to the firm's previous work for Allman Enterprises. Very limited, discreet work. We need to evaluate whether Allman is a current client. Because if Allman is a current client, 1.7 applies, and that's a lot stricter than 1.9. So we always have to ask in, in these conflict questions, who is the client? What is the relation to the representation? Make a determination as to whether 1.7 or 1.9 applies. 1.7 directly adverse, and remember, we underscored the point that even unrelated work could be uh, directly adverse. But that was not the case here. Uh, Allman was not a current client, and then it says, if you decide Allman is a former client, would 1.9 permit you to represent Star? And we said yes, and we just went through our checklist. Not the same matter, not even substantially related. You just have a series of uh, newsletter uh, contacts. You have Almond always saying we don't need your services, uh, and there's nothing materially adverse. So you would be permitted to represent Star against Almond, former client in quotation marks. So the next section deal starts with uh, dealing with former clients in practice. Now this is a this is an actual case. It happened not that long ago, five or six years ago, and toxic waste. Problem eight two on page three forty five. So how are we going to break this down? So we're going to use everything that we talked about thus far in terms of former clients and apply it uh, in this case to figure out the representation. And it's, this, this case is deliberately uh, tricky because it, uh, I think lawyers in practice oftentimes say, well, that was 20 years ago, no big deal. Well, that was uh, five years ago, no, no big deal. The representation ended, there's nothing ongoing, and I'll just use common sense and there's no conflict. So what we're trying to emphasize here is always go to the rule uh, and look at the factual situation that you're in. Uh, because the passage of time may not do anything to this information. And we have to figure out uh, all of these relationships. So starting with this problem, toxic waste, I guess the state wants to hire our law firm to initiate a lawsuit, state against NCC, major uh, chemical manufacturer, uh, it's environmental litigation, and our firm is, uh, this is the proposed lawsuit. Now let me sort of going through these facts, I want you to sort of tell me what things jump out at you that might make our former representation a problem. So we start with this firm formally represented NCC 20 years ago. So you might say we're home free 20 years ago. It's almost a generation. It is a generation. So we are in the state. We have specialized expertise. We do environmental resources work, specialized ex expertise. The state always uh, contacts us as a matter of our expertise, and we're economical because we uh, have contingent fees, which saves the, the state a lot of money. They don't have to use the attorney general's office or uh, state attorneys to do this work. They partner with us and they get a good deal. Contingency fee plus our great expertise. We brought lawsuits and we are generally always successful. Never lost a case that goes to trial. Now, this proposed lawsuit, the state wants us to take on a big case against NCC, a multi-billion dollar chemical company, alleging that NCC has dumped insufficiently treated chemical waste in one of the state's rivers. So they're dumping and dumping. NCC, of course, says uh, nothing of the kind. We comply with all EPA regulations, all state regulations, all county regulations. No problem here. So identify the factors that might cause this to be a former conflict. What, what things in the facts do you see that we should be looking at before we go through this case? So I want, I want uh, this like to be real life. It's, uh, we just got into the office, we've answered all our emails, we checked over the uh, memo that we're drafting, that's pretty good. Uh, now it's like 10.30 and we start, uh, get a call from our supervising attorney, he said, I want you to take a look at this. He sends us this over email, and he's giving you all this background that I've already talked about. Now, your first step is to analyze the factors that could make this a former conflict. And after we identify that, then we have to figure out what can we do about it. So what, kind of, what factors are you looking at? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, that's actually, yeah, more recent, that's good. And so, well, how does that impact your analysis? Well, I, I, think it'd be, I think it's harder to, to fully move away from it. Um, it was just 20 years, you know, 20 years ago, as you read on, um, a lot of people had to deal with it, they were far gone or passed away or retired. Um, but within 10 years, uh, it makes it more recent, there's probably more people that were involved 10 years ago than there were 20 years ago. Okay. So that, that's an interesting twist. Is this work current enough to cause a former conflict? Very interesting, that's good. Anything else? So what we're talking about, as you see on page 346, uh, NCC stopped using chemicals in food wrapping, but started using chemicals in other products, and that was 10 years after the FDA approval. What about our work? We want this, the, you're doing two things when you analyze these former conflicts. You're looking at uh, relationships between entities and clients, of course, but you also have to look at our work. What about our work? Yeah. Um, we in the past helped them get gain approval to use uh, board chemicals. Uh -huh. That's the issue that everyone's trying to go after. Okay, help gain uh, an FDA application. I'll just look for 
fluorochemicals and there is overlap between this and the whole loss of good. So notice how the facts are, are we, we did an FDA approval, there's been a shift in terms of how this uh, information has been used, but uh, NCC is still using this chemical, so, so that's the problem. Uh, NCC, you see the top of page 347, discharges into waterways, but they claim that there's no significant environmental hazard because we use effective treatment techniques and comply with all regulations. That's what FCC wants to say. Anything else? So we talked about the, the nature of the matter. It's not 20 years, maybe still current. We talked about our previous work. We helped gain approval and FDA application for floral chemicals. And there's overlap between this and the proposed lawsuit because the lawsuit alleges that NCC continues to dump floral chemicals into the state waterways. Anything else? What about more about the nature of our work? Uh, think about, uh, what about motion practice? Uh, you know, one question you have to ask yourself, uh, what will discovery mean in this case? You know, just because something is 20 years old or 10 years old, we may uncover something that would be information under 1.9c that would be to the disadvantage of a former client. So that's something we have to keep in mind. What about, let's go inside the firm. Let's talk about uh, Max Freeberg and Ellen Pestle. What about that? What about Max Freeberg? Okay, be careful, that's good. Let's back up though. Let's talk about what type of work Max Freeberg did. What did he do? I'm trying to get a sense of what type of knowledge is flowing through the firm. I'm putting quotation marks flowing through the firm, but you, you said that pretty much everyone is either retired, Max passes away after he retires. But we're gonna come back to Ellen Cashel because she's still around, she's around 20 years ago. She's a first year associate, now she's a partner. And we have to look at, at her, her work as well. What about Max Freeberg? Yeah, go ahead. I'll say that again. Okay. Study all uh, reports. And what FDA application. So that's chemical reports, analysis, company memos, everything that would help us get FDA approval. Information is not public. Notice this information is not public. And notice what that means. Uh, NCC in the litigation is going to, uh, NCC will claim trade secrets. That's it. So we have a, I'll just put it there, retired, passed away. So notice how this, this problem sort of entices you to say, oh, that's, that's not a problem, Max is gone. But you always have to look at the information that the firm might have. So you see on the top of page 347, uh, it is highly likely, given industry standards and the company's press releases over the years, touting its engineering and legal research to ensure compliance, that NCC chemists studied the toxicity of floral chemicals and the effectiveness of various waste treatments even before NCC started making a full packaging product. That's going to be interesting about notice, what did NCC do, know, and then what is our relationship to that information. And that notice that Freeberg have reviewed those studies. And as we just pointed out, NCC has never made the uh, results of those of that research public. And they would probably claim trade secrets. So Max Freeberg is no longer there, but we have uh, Ellen Pastel. Now, she uh, was a first year associate. So she did work on it. Now, a partner. Can't, I'll just put can't remember. She can't remember details. She remembers working on it, but that's about it. And so, you see this, this is location 347. Firm also notice this. Firm has no records. Records are destroyed after, after five years. And then uh, the only document that we have is the FDA application of the public document. So now what? Now what? So everybody's gone, the only person that's still there is Ellen. She was an associate, did work on it, can't remember all details. Uh, but she does remember something that's important. What does she remember that might cause us to be worried about a conflict? Yeah. Uh, so what I said about Pastor was that she does remember the um, people within the company. Uh -huh. She disagreed about the effect of the treatment. Uh -huh. So if this is generally known, then you can still use that information. But if it's not, then that's a protected information. Oh, that's interesting. And I believe that's what I'm about generally known. So Again, it's not known. If it was generally known outside the company and representation that people within the FCC
necessarily know that you can use that. Because you're not hurting anybody's off circulating. It's in the Courier Journal, it's in trade journals. There have been protests, there have been rallies, everybody's talking about it. That's fine. And so that's more like public information is out there. Now, what about this internal thing you're doing? Because that's interesting. Um, if it's not known publicly. Yeah, if only people in the company or in the firm knew that people within the company disagreed about the effectiveness of the um, floor chemicals, uh -huh. then you can't use that information directly first. Okay. Um, So she doesn't remember anything, but she does remember that some within the company disagree about the effectiveness of MCC's waste management. In other words, there, there was a compliance issue when we did this FDA application. Doesn't recall any details. So everybody's gone away, and we have this uh, this one tidbit of information. So this is what we've done thus far in our analysis. Now we have to figure out what can we do. So you see the bottom of page 347. May we accept the Attorney General's invitation to represent the state in this litigation? So be us against the former client. How do we analyze this under 1.9 and can we take on this representation? May we represent the state? So, I think we're, we know this is not the same matter, but we definitely have some problems with uh, substantially related. <coughs> Why do I say that? So can we jump in and say, okay, we represent the state against NCC? And another thing I'm highlighting, this, this is not really in this problem, but another thing you have to think about is, maybe the former client doesn't give a consent, maybe because it's a former representation, we do something called screening that might help we do all of the steps. But then there's always the possibility of a motion for disqualification. Remember when we first started the federal there all of this law that you have to look at. You have to look at, of course, the code of professional responsibility, but there are other things that govern our conduct, you know, rules of procedure, disqualification law, ethics decision. So can we represent the state? Yeah, it's 20 years ago, this represent. And if that's the case, what do you think the former client might say? Tell us why do you think that this is substantially related. I think you're right, I just want you to point to um, what you're looking at. The main thing for me that stands out is that it's the same, like the floral chemicals are, are the main issue here, mm -hmm. uh, which is what the firm helped them on the board. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, that makes it substantially related. Okay. So notice, so it, we're saying that the subject matter is the same. Maybe in a different context, when we were doing some compliance issue, administrative law, FDA, all of that, uh, now we're doing an environmental uh, litigation, but the key component that unites both of those scenarios, both of those matters, is floral chemicals. So what we did before involved floral chemicals, and this litigation will deal with compliance with floral chemicals. So there's some type of analysis. Okay, keep going, yeah, that's good. Um, and then I think that the interest of the state, uh, which would be our client in this situation, would be materially adverse to NCC because obviously NCC wants to continue their use of floral chemicals, and the state would want to so, you know, control that so that would be adverse. Now that's good, now look, look at that. So that, we don't really have a definition of what materially adverse is, but we know it's something that goes against our former client's interest. And this certainly would. We'd be going against our former client and saying that they didn't comply. On some level, undoing, in quotation marks, what we did previously, because we were vouching for our client NCC 20 years ago by saying they fully complied, they're entitled to this FDA application. There was some dissension within the firm, I mean, sorry, within the company, disagreeing about the compliance, and the lawyer knew that. But what about this, Ms. Boyd, what about this? It's 20 years later, the primary attorney, Max Freeberg, has passed away, and even before that, he retired, so he gets further away from this information. I don't pass, I can't remember anything, just that there was some type of argument. And so, could we say that all of the damaging and Disadvantageous information that would hurt our former client has really left the firm. So, since that is the case, we can represent the state. What do you say to that? Um, I would say no, just because the rule um, doesn't uh, address the, like, the a time constraint. I was trying to look through the comments because I thought I saw something about how things could expire over a certain time. That might have been in a different rule. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. But, um, like, the rule itself doesn't say anything about time. But I think those factors about how it has been 20 years and the same attorneys don't work there anymore could go into a conversation about informed consent for NCC if you were interested in pursuing representation. But I think, I don't think we could without informed consent. Okay, and I don't think we're gonna get informed consent really because of our relationship. So that's that's good. Uh, I think you might be referring to we haven't done imputation yet, but maybe if everyone leaves the firm, uh, that means that the taint of the conflict isn't running through the firm anymore. And if there's no one left with the firm who still has information that could hurt the former client, the firm can then represent, uh, even though it is against the former client's interest, because there's no information in the firm to hurt the former client. Uh, so that's interesting. So what do you think happened in real life? This is a real. Okay. So notice, and I think most courts will do this before we get there. Uh, the fact that we say that. Uh, 
Allen really doesn't matter, doesn't remember, that's going to be irrelevant to us because those women, Ms. Borgia, she was a 1.9A. And there's that presumption of what type of information that the attorney would normally obtain in the representation. And you know, NCC is going to come back and say, uh, well, they knew everything about us. It's 20 years later, but we're still talking about floral chemicals. There may have been advances uh, in technology, certainly, uh, but these basic principles in our documents is something that is in the, the uh, knowledge of the firm. So even though the firm has no records, there is a uh, public document out there, and someone could conceivably interpret that public document based upon information received from the former client. So what do you think happened in real life? In the real case, I should say. The real case is like uh, Minnesota against 3M, Minnesota manufacturing in the 90s. What do you think? So uh, the, the court really didn't totally resolve uh, the issue. But what do you think happened? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I kept hearing about this qualification. So this is state against 3M, Minnesota against 3M. Uh, and so the, the firm is Covington and Burling, and 3M uh, moves for disqualification. The trial court disqualified Covington and Burling as violating uh, Rule 1.9. So it then moves up to the Supreme Court of Minnesota, and they did something interesting. I don't know what happened, but they remanded the case uh, on, on two points. One, uh, and this was uh, interesting, uh, one is, had this confidential information become public in 20 years? So that's interesting that we even had that discussion because that's one of the things that the Supreme Court remanded on. So did this information become public? And then there's another little wrinkle that isn't in these facts, but that happened in the real case. Three young waited a long time. So sometimes uh, entities or firms or clients will wait and wait and wait, and then they file a motion for disqualification, sort of like a strategic tactic, uh, and, and that was a problem. So the court said that three young waived its right to claim disqualification by waiting until the firm had spent so much time and expense on the case. So that's toxic waste. So, We've done 1.7, we've done 1.9, we keep looking at those two uh, together. Now we look at rule 1.10, imputation. So, I want to know how 1.10 works. What is this concept of imputation? Now we've seen this before, when I mentioned that the conflict really travels through the firm. We are one lawyer for conflict purposes. And so we have to figure out how imputation works. I want to take apart this rule piece by piece and then figure out. So, imputation. So, we want to break this rule down. We're going to look at 1.110a. How does this rule work? associated in the firm, we're all together, this is our firm, none of them should normally represent a client, but any one of them practicing alone would be prohibited from doing so. By a current conflict, so maybe I'm representing somebody and I haven't really checked correctly and I have this conflict, so everybody has that conflict. Or, I don't have a current conflict, but I just moved over from another firm uh, in room uh, 171, I moved from that firm to this firm, I currently represent someone in 171, uh, and that was the former representation, but I bring uh, something with me that conflicts with that. There may be information that this firm could use against the matter uh, in 171, and then that conflict would travel throughout the room. We are one lawyer for conflict purposes. So, a lawyer shall not knowingly represent a client when any one of them practicing the law will be prohibited from doing so under 1.7 or 1.9, unless. So, that's what? Ms. Barnes, keep going. Okay. So, what do you think that personal interest is? So, this, this is interesting. It might be something singular to me that could ostensibly look like a conflict, but it doesn't travel through this room. So say we're a big time a constitutional law firm, uh, we do a First Amendment work, 14th Amendment work, all levels, state and national practice, uh, and the firm, like the ACLU, sort of embraces uh, free speech absolutism. We want the marketplace of ideas to flow completely. The firm at a, a meeting, I'm one of the partners in the firm, we have this discussion, and the firm outvotes me and they say, we're going to uh, represent an organization uh, that uh, is against equal rights. 
any, anything that says equal rights, this organization is against it. Uh, and, and so we choose to represent them because they give speeches across the country, and we want to make sure the content of their speech is not uh, undermined by the state. So the First Amendment uh, is what we are representing. Not representing the client, not uh, advocating for whatever particular viewpoint. My firm has this broader view that we have to represent this organization in order to advance constitutional ideas. I hate this organization, and I, I'm really angry at my partners, and I say, I'm not going to participate in this. Uh, so that wouldn't run through the firm. They are just keeping me away from it. I'd get no fee. I would just not participate. But that's my, my personal interest. And so that isn't going to impact the firm. And, and so they would certainly keep me away from it because uh, I wouldn't be able to give the competent and diligent representation that is required. So that's the personal interest of the disqualified lawyer. And it doesn't present a significant risk of limiting the representation of the client by the main lawyers in the firm. Now, if I say something like this, okay, I am the major managing partner. If you take this on, uh, I'm going to make life difficult for you. I'm going to reassign the research team. I'm going to not give you enough money. I'm going to talk against it out of, uh, out of the law firm. Any junior uh, associate who works on it, I'm going to give them a bad job. That would be totally disruptive. Uh, and that would be a real question about materially limiting. Uh, the representation, but if it's just a personal interest, that attorney, the disqualified attorney, just wouldn't participate, and that would be fine. So that's personal interest. Or, what does two say? So, for one way for conflict purposes, if we have a kind of formal conflict, it, it runs through the firm, cannot represent it. If one of us singularly cannot represent, personal interest is not a disqualifier. So, what does two do? I'll just put the entire prohibition. Two prohibition. So this is the former conflict, 4B. It arises out of the disqualified lawyers association with a prior. So that's the scenario where migratory lawyer comes over to this new firm, brings something with him that conflicts in the whole room. Uh, now shares my conflict that I brought with me from room uh, 171. So this former client representation, based upon my association with the former firm, causes a conflict to run through this room. It's imputed to all of them. And so even though conflicts are imputed based upon 147 and 1.9, uh, the firm is not precluded from doing it if it's just a personal interest, or if the lawyer moves from one firm to another, it arises out of my previous work. Tell me about little number one and little number two. What can I do if I come over to the firm from room 171, I have this conflict. Conflict is running through the room because you share my conflict. What can you do then so that we can still represent the current client, even though we have this former client conflict? What can we do? Just write it down. Assuming that it's not a lawyer from the team that would act as any of the records or information about me, uh, representation. Okay. So if you look at this, we want to sort of contain this conflict. So we put up a, a screen, timely screen, from any petition. So notice this, you go through this rule, and you sort of, if you had to write a letter, you can just track the language of the rule. So we have attorney, he moved over here, we're aware of this conflict, this is what we did. And so notice, we're not even asking for consent, we're saying we took action in screen, and we're allowing you to comment on it, but, but this is what we uh, what we did. So, uh, disqualified lawyer, of a timely screen. Timely screen, disqualified lawyer, from any participation in the matter. I'll just put no money, no fee. So you're not working on it, you're not deriving any benefit from it. And notice all of this stuff. Really notice. So we want this to happen quickly. Timely screen, written notice, promptly, to any affected client. Former client, I should say. So notice, when, I'm not putting all of this, this isn't a rule. When you have, a, when you give, written notice properly to the effective former client, you want to enable that former client to make sure that you are actually complying with the provisions of the rule. And so notice this Roman numeral, uh, a small Roman numeral two up here, has a lot of components that have to be in this written notice. So you tell them, yeah, we set up the screen, but this is how we do it. Description of the screening procedures employed, so there should be some language that timely screen, no participation in the matter, you might define what no participation means, no fees, a statement of the firm and of the screen lawyer's compliance with these rules. So we have the uh, disqualified lawyer sign this letter as well and a statement that review may be available before tribunal. So notice you're inviting the former client. If you have a problem with this and we can't resolve it uh, to your satisfaction, you can move for a motion to disqualify. And agreement by the firm to respond promptly to any written questions or objections by the former client about the screening procedures. So you might be able to resolve this through written notice. This is what we did. Former client comes back, oh, I don't like that, could you do this? And maybe, okay, and then that's fine. But there always is the possibility of a motion for disqualification. So timely screen, written notice. Uh, make sure you follow all the details. I won't put them all on, on the board because they're in the rule. You can just look at the rule. Follow all steps. And then, there's one more component. So you timely screen, written notice, and certificates of compliance. Certification of compliance. 
So you're affirming that you read the rule, you analyzed the conflict, you saw that the conflict existed, you took timely action, you responded by telling the former uh, client that this was going on, allowed the former client to protest or ask any questions, and then you certified that you complied with these rules. So we provide that to the former client by the screen disqualified lawyer and a partner of the firm at reasonable intervals upon the former client's written request and upon termination of the screen procedure. So constant contact. We comply, and then there is this mechanism for continued compliance and communication with the former client. Now, someone tell me what 110B means. It's like, this, this is sort of the scenario when we had uh, Freeberg passing away after retiring from the firm, then the question is how much information is left with the firm. Look at 110B. Uh, so you have a lawyer terminating the association with a firm. The firm is not prohibited from representing a person with interests that are materially adverse. You know, materially adverse to the former client. Unless the matter is the same and substantially related, and any lawyer remaining in the firm has information protected. Article 1.6. So in our hypo, if Freeberg passes away, doesn't have any information, and maybe Paso, she leaves the firm within a, uh, in a certain time, then there's no more information with the firm and that firm can continue the representation, even if it's materially adverse, because there's no information to disadvantage that former client. We'll be going against the former client, materially adverse, but there's nothing to disadvantage or hurt that client. If you look at principles of disqualification, uh, notes two and three, so, sort of summarizes what I just said. Uh, this disqualification can be waived by uh, an affected client. And then the rule just says, uh, a final thing that we're gonna talk about when we talk about uh, Former client, former client conflict is the revolving door when, when the attorney goes from private to public practice and public to private. We'll talk about that. That's going to start happening more and more as we move towards Thanksgiving. People will be moving in and out of the uh, administration. It happens every year and a half before uh, a major national election. So that's imputation. So, in a reading, talks about that. If you look on page 354 to 355 of the chart, that's what we just did. So, most of these uh, imputed conflicts can be waived, you see in the rule. And that's comment six. That's what, that's what we did. But look at uh, a brief consultation on page 361. This is a, another problem. So this is designed to, this problem, is designed to give us some practice with imputation. So. So we still keep 1.9 in your mind, but this next problem is going to make us unpack how imputation works. So we, we still have this rule, and we, we now have a procedure where even though a former client conflict may exist, we have a procedure that allows us to continue with the representation uh, even if we don't get informed consent, because you remember in, uh, when we're looking at rule 1.10, uh, what we did was say, well, there is a prohibition based on 1.9. It arises out of the lawyer who moves over former representation. We pinpointed that conflict, county screen, gave written notice, certificates of compliance. That allows the former client to protest or ask questions, and maybe we can move this on uh, without a motion to disqualify. But here on page uh, 361, a brief consultation, another actual case. We're dealing with uh, still imputation. So here we have a situation where we are a partner at this firm, uh, what is it, Shoemaker and, and Western. We have a client which is Summit Bank, and there's ultimately a dispute. Uh, in a previous uh, capacity, Lavelle, who is our partner, provided advice on tax matters uh, to Hadley as a, as a tax consultant to the law firm Davies and Davies. So lots of information shared. Uh, and then Lavelle moves from uh, uh, Hadley to become a partner at uh, Shoemaker and Watson. She did tax advice work for uh, Davies when she was uh, formerly at the other firm. And so, notice on uh, page 362. After they identified this uh, formal representation conflict, Lavelle, who was moved over, explained on the form that, explained on the, on the form that there had been work that she did a year earlier for Davies and Davies as a tax consultant, work that may conflict with what they're doing now. So, this is on the middle page 362. She explained on the form that a year earlier, Davies at the John Davies firm had contacted her at Hartland and Lavelle to retain her for some expert tax advice. She agreed to do this work, so she gets copies of correspondence between Hadley and the bank. This is the dispute. Uh, she explained what she thought about them. Uh, she gets information about the type of suit, negotiations, that type of thing, what type of defenses the bank might raise, and how he would respond to those defenses. Now, Lavelle, after she moves, she works for uh, Shoemaker and Watson. And so the question is, is Hadley a former client? Look at this engagement letter. Does that raise any flags? Lavelle does research, and she says this, tax research. We will assist your firm in reviewing income tax issues relating to the Hadley Farm suit against Summit Bank and such other matters as are agreed to in the future. So that may be a continuing relationship. 
So we have this. The proposed litigation is LA against Summit Bank. Davies and Davies is a firm. The bill provided advice on tax matters. And then moves to Shoemaker and Watt. <coughs> So we have this engagement letter. Uh, LaBelle did some research on tax issues that would uh, arise in settlement or judgment. She sent an email to Davies about her conclusion, and LaBelle said that Davies had informed uh, Petley, the owner of the firm, that she was consulting on the case and would provide assistance as needed. So Davies informed the client of LaBelle's uh, continuing role. I'll put a question mark. Engagement. That's going to be key. So we're concerned about this. She did previous work for someone that we are now uh, suing. That's not suing us. We're on the other side of the bit. So on page 363, aside from this consultation, the Davis firm requested no further services from LaBelle. Money is paid, you see, and that's that. Now she made a Watson learns these facts about a week before LaBelle began her work. And as soon as she arrives at the firm, we implement a screen to prevent anyone in the firm from talking about the heavy litigation with LaBelle. We send an email, and we also send a letter to the Davis firm. Tommy Spring, Tommy Spring LaBelle, and we send a letter uh, to the Davies firm. Look at the letter. So notice how it's written, but it sort of tracks the language of the rule. You can sort of do that in practice just to make sure you have all the language and you have a, a documentation of a compliant. So she joined our firm. We're aware that she previously advised on a dispute between Happy Fine Farm and our client, Summit Bank. So she gave tax advice here, and now she's crossed over uh, to the bank, and Hadley is suing the bank. So we screened LaBelle from uh, in contact, notified all employees, not to discuss it with her. Removed from all email lists, files have been secured, no portion of fees, and she agrees uh, to not participate. That's a pretty good uh, notice, but notice some things are, are missing, uh, particularly the ability to uh, seek relief in the tribunal. That's missing. And that we will respond properly to any uh, written inquiries or questions from the uh, from the firm. So that's okay. The written notice is pretty good. The letter signed by us and the firm of Lavelle, and heavily the former client will not waive the conflict. And so what we have is a letter threatening disqualification. Three months later, after all of this, uh, our firm gets this letter from Davey saying that we have a conflict of interest. Kelly, the former client, will not waive the conflict. And now we're in a situation where we have a motion to disqualify. So they say we better withdraw or if not, we will be subject to a motion uh, to disqualify. Uh, the bank is our regular client summit. We're earning good money from this client. We don't want to withdraw, but we're also concerned that if we don't withdraw and we go through the time and expense of contesting this, it's going to cost us some money. Uh, if a court is likely to disqualify us, withdrawing voluntarily will save us time and money that will be spent fighting this disqualification. Courts in our state use ethics code to decide motions for disqualification. So we're going to be looking at 1.9. We're going to be looking at three things, really. 1.7, 1.9, 110. On this motion to disqualify. So Davies had waited three months before sending this lady letter requesting withdrawal, so that's interesting. But three months, you see on the top of page uh, 364, it's not going to be viewed as a long time to wait. Should we withdraw? Should we withdraw? Now, when we come back, we're going to end up. So, when we come back, I want you to be able to articulate arguments on either side of the motion to disqualify. So, supporting the motion <coughs> to disqualify. That's the arguments that uh, Hedley and Davies would make. And then opposing the motion to disqualify. That's the argument of the Summit Bank and Shoemaker and Watson with that. And we'll pick up there Thursday. Have a good afternoon.